A man slowly rides his horse through narrow streets. Upon his hunched shoulders, he wears a black cloak, the hood pulled up and hanging loosely around his scowling face. Small fires burn around him as soldiers rush past. In the distance, screams continue to ring out. The sounds of violence reverberate off the stone walls of the ancient city. The man upon the horse moves past a half-buried mass grave. The troops who have been digging it had rushed off to continue their slaughter. As the man rode on, a woman rushed out of the tavern. She was nude and covered with small wounds. Her eyes were frantic with animal fear of one who knew their end was near. Please don't let them take me, she screamed at the man on the horse. His frown deepened as he looked down upon her. Several armed men emerged from the tavern and dragged her back inside as she screamed. For the first time this day, the frowning man cracked a slight smile and continued through the city. podcast a show where we take a look at the important men and women of history and decide once and for all if they are worth all the fuss i'm jordan and my name is david well done brother that was the best one you've ever done try actually though actually one try that time (laughs) for real well done sir okay okay i don't have my script pulled up because we we got excited about unprepared well we got excited about that intro that you and the audience just listened to for the first time it was great. And, uh, and I, I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was fun to make. Um, big shout out to Michael Gelfie Studios. They're the ones who supplied all those sounds. And by supplied, I mean they're, they're free, f- free for yeah, people nice. to use. Um, just give them a shout out. They do have a Patreon if you want to do that or a band camp. So you can check them out. D&D related stuff. Just kind Ooh. of oh, yeah. you know, background ambiance and, yeah. and music and, and a bunch of music. Yeah. It's really good. So, and as you heard, they sound really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So... Another thing I want to do before we get started today is we actually have some comments. Oh, yes, that's right. Now, interestingly, uh, a few like few episodes back, I decided, okay, I'm going to dump all the like 10 videos we had so or mm-hmm. podcasts so right, far right. onto YouTube. Mm-hmm. And uh, that is where more people have heard it by far than on the actual podcast. Somehow. Yeah, and it's probably not like full listens. It's probably views, quote unquote. That's fair. It yeah. seems like the most uh, inconvenient way to listen to a podcast Right, but, they, but the most know, convenient hey, way to, to hear you. a podcast and comment on it—that's true. It is yeah. very. So we got a couple comments comment. from there. So the Didius Julianus episode, which did a Good old fairly Didius. well. Yep, uh, Nesta said, "Fantastic episode. I love the joshing around sprinkled with history." I think she meant <laughs> joshing around. They meant <laughs> sprinkled with the history. I hope it's yeah, not yeah. just joshing around and some history. And some history. No, that's what it is for sure. 100%. And then uh, on the Severus episode, which interestingly, so that's like the first one to go up and do worse. On, on on YouTube. Well, it did worse on like it's only had three downloads on podcast form. Oh, in gotcha. a month, yeah, gotcha. which is interesting wow. because all the others are like well, more than said, that. They said, "Nope, that's it." <laughs> nope. But I'm then done. the <laughs> YouTube has like seventy views already. So you know, <laughs> hey, I just hope people enjoy it. But uh, anyway, we got a comment on there from Disc O Satan. Oh, so it's spelled Disco, oh, Disco Satan. Maybe it's Disc mm-hmm. O S. Oh, there's a space. O S, the number eight N, so disc, O oh, Satan. You're right, that's how you would probably say it. But I like disco Satan better. Disco Satan. So we're just gonna go break with that. down. <laughs> so great episode, fellows. Looking forward to the next one. Thank you very much. And if you guys want to leave comments, do that. If you want to mail in the old fashioned way, wow. To email. There you go. <laughs> the I was old like, what do you mean old? Man? Like we might give well, out addresses. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but you know, at this point, uh, the email is probably the old man way of saying, "Hey, reach out." That's true. <laughs> the great right. podcast. Uh, mail at gmail.com I think Don't look at me I didn't know <laughs> Don't <look> at <laughs> well this has gotten off to a very bright and cheerful start so now let's talk about our boy today Caracalla it sounds like the bright is going to continue in, it is from that intro it sounds like a happy cheery time I, it really the nice man again you do not know who that right. man was but I'm but I know that scene takes part of what's happening so that's fair <laughs> all right well 
As I said, we don't really need a recap because we're going to go through Caracalla's life and he was around through all of Severus's reign. Well, there you go. So it's pretty easy. Caracalla was born April 4th, 188 CE in the city of Lugdunum. That's where his ah. dad was the governor up in Gaul. Uh, his dad obviously being Severus and his mother, Julia Domna. Mm-hmm. Quite the impressive woman that we were looking at last week. So Severus was a very successful equestrian mm-hmm. turned senator by Marcus Aurelius. Horses. Horses to uh, togas. Uh, and he was serving as the governor of Gaul, as I said. Julia Damna was the daughter of Bassianus of Amessa, and their family were descendants of the priest kings of the past. Ah, yes. Of the sun god Elagabalus mm-hmm. and the associated mm-hmm. black stone, Damna, meaning black in Arabic. Just a recap there for those who forgot last time. Uh, so he was born with the name Lucius Septimius Bassianus, Bassianus after his grandfather. The year after his birth, Caracalla, as we know him, got a little brother, Publius Septimius Geta. What a name. Yep. Got a little it's Publius. not quite as cool as Lucius Septimius Bassianus. That Publius really takes you out of it. It sure does. Yeah. And Geta. Yeah. <laughs> he was born March 7th, 89 CE. Did I say? I think I said 180. Couldn't tell you. Okay. Yep. I'm like, uh, <laughs> these numbers are not right. 189 CE. I'm like, are we that back in Domitian's time? So. The, oh. The dog got through the barricade at the top of the stairs, it would seem. Hi, buddy. You're making this hard. <laughs> Go upstairs, buddy. Usually usually he's not so bold as to push through a pair of chairs blocking the top of the stairs. Ha ha. You have been thwarted. Yeah, I, th- I didn't think he would. He usually doesn't. And he doesn't like being in the basement anyway. He's getting a lot more... Uh bold there that's the word yep all right yes so anyway Geta was born march 7th 189 ce the two were still very young when the year of the five emperors kicked off in 193 ce good year it's a good year it was a very good year kind of a misnomer because there weren't five emperors but there were three it would have been strange to the boys when mommy got a letter from daddy and suddenly they were fleeing rome in the night right they wouldn't understand that Pertinax was dead and Didius Julianus might mean to do the children harm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They also would not have understood why Daddy was wearing a purple cloak. Does, don't emperors do that? When they arrived back in Gaul. And it wouldn't uh, make any sense why he was rushing off to Rome with his armies at all. As the following years uh, were very hectic, we know little about what Severus's children did mm-hmm. uh, while he fought Niger and the Eastern client states. Likely, they would have been in Rome after the city was secured. Julia Domna was very likely helping run the administration alongside Prefect Plautianus, who we mentioned last time. This was Severus's longtime friend. Mm-hmm. And apparently, he was a nasty son bitch. <laughs> That's right. He yeah. didn't mind. <laughs> Not well liked by <laughs> anybody. Julia Domna and Plautianus would spend the following years trying to outmaneuver each other and gain Severus's undivided attention mm-hmm. so that they could, you know, have more power. However, once Severus returned from the east, he pulled the seven-year-old Caracalla aside and told him something. He said that it was only right his eldest son be heir to his throne. That's right, the co yep. emperorship is nope, back. Not oops, oh, getting ahead of yourself sorry. there. He was officially declared Caesar ah. at this point. Yep. The young boy All probably right. still couldn't truly understand the gravity of the situation, sure. but it would have probably dawned on him fairly quickly because as soon as his father had said he was Caesar, he had to rush off to go fight some guy named Albinus. Mm-hmm. And wasn't he Caesar? Right. Since I was a little kid? Uh-huh. Hmm. Well, what do you really know that or like understand that? Right. It's questionable. He was seven, so probably not. Yeah. But uh, he might have over time right. kind of figured it out. Still, he didn't need to worry about it long if he did at yeah, all. Right. <laughs> yeah. Severus made short work of his latest opponent and sent Albinus's head back to Rome. That's right. Can't hurt you now. Yep. Probably sigh of relief there from everyone in the yeah. Severan family. Like, okay, yeah. thank God. Along with the new title, Caracalla also got a new name. Oh, there we go. Severus had himself posthumously adopted by Marcus Aurelius Mm -hmm. to lend credibility to his rule. As a result, Caracalla was officially renamed to Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. And that was his official name for the rest of time. There you go. This uh, very technically made him part of the Antonine dynasty. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's dead, but he adopted me. I swear. I, sw- well, I swear. But it, even if he, <laughs> yeah, I'm the emperor and he did. So there you go. <laughs> in 198 CE, Severus was back from his conquest against the Parthian Empire. During his triumph, Severus announced a change to the succession, which you just mentioned. His Mm. 10-year-old son would no longer be his Caesar. Ah, Instead, Caracalla was now officially joint emperor. That's right. The co-ruler. Yep. And the crowd went wild. (sighs) I hope so. They were just like, huh. Yeah, <laughs> or or they were just like, okay, just clap. Yep, Severus doesn't <laughs> like it when you don't clap. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. In 202 CE, Caracalla was named consul for the first time alongside his father. Caracalla, by this point, probably couldn't believe how well he was doing. Yeah. He was in a priesthood, which I didn't mention, but it doesn't really doesn't matter. Really matter. Yeah. But he was consul, and he was joint emperor before even hitting puberty. Clearly, good. He, nothing he couldn't do. Really successful. Doesn't have anything to do with just being born into it. What? No. Yeah, no. 100%. He merit. is awesome. Yes. yes just yeah. absolutely wonderful Obviously. is the young man, Caracalla. Right. Yep. It was also around this time that Severus took his sons out east for a bit of a vacation between wars. Nice. They visited the tomb of Alexander the Great. That's right. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. It is likely at this time that Caracalla began to develop a great love for the Macedonian warrior king. A fascination that would follow him throughout his life. It is pretty cool. Yeah, plus, you know, his dad was a soldier. Alexander the Great's a soldier. Yeah. Just makes sense. Adds up. It does. On the way back, the emperor decided it was high time his 14-year-old son got married. (laughs) It is unknown what Caracalla thought of getting married in general. What we do know is that he hated the girl chosen to be his bride. (laughs) As we saw last time, this girl was Fulvia Plautilla, daughter of Praetorian prefect Plautianus. Yep. The guy that no one likes. Correct. Caracalla despised Plautianus more than most, uh, likely because of how much Julia Domina hated the man. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure Mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to adopt your mother's hate when you're living there the whole time. Yep. Caracalla protested loudly at the match, but in the end, he was just a child and had no say in the matter. He married her at his father's command. That didn't mean he was going to have anything to do with her, though. It would seem this was one of the first times he'd been told to do something he did not wish to do, and he lashed out. He vowed that when he was in charge, <laughs> That's right. he would have both their heads. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> but still, he can't right now, so life goes on. A few years passed, and Caracalla found himself serving his second consulship in 205 CE. This time, alongside his little brother, Geta. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How very nice that they are working together. Yeah. Of course, they nice. weren't really working together because from an early age, the two had not gotten along. As they don't. Correct. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes it's petty squabbles and sometimes it's I will try to beat you to death as a child. Right. Julia Domna did her best to keep the two at peace, but they were getting older now. Upper teens. Not great. That's right. Time to have a duel. Let's yep. go. Go to the Coliseum. Hash it out. Threats were made constantly, yeah. <laughs> and the occasional fight did break out. I might have over-exaggerated about beating each other to death, but typically this only happened when Severus was away. <laughs> Likely irritated at being hindered by both his parents, Caracalla grew frustrated. He loathed his brother. He likewise hated his wife and father-in-law, right. but no one would let him do anything against them. So he came up with a plan. <laughs> now, I'm conjecturing here, as many have done before me. So... Last time, we saw the group of centurions who approached Severus to warn him that they had been paid to kill the emperors. The payer was none other than Plautianus. Right. Who was getting too big for his britches. Mm -hmm. Julia Domna jumped at this news and played into her husband's temper and hatred of disloyalty. That same day, Plautianus arrived at the palace. That's right. Let's kill him. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he entered a room with Caracalla, Severus, Geta, and the Praetorian Prefect. I'm making some of this up for a dramatic effect, but this is roughly what happened. When accused of his crimes, he adamantly denied them. He was not plotting anything. He hadn't paid anybody. What are you talking about, man? I would never. Yeah. By some tellings, Caracalla grew very angry at this denial, stepped forward, and punched him in the face. (laughs) That's right, because when you're accused of a crime that you didn't do and you deny it, I hate you. (laughs) Yep. And this is a 17-year-old man now. So, like, he's big enough to punch a grown man and hurt him badly. So he dropped him to the floor. He, then either he or Severus ordered the man be killed and he was beheaded. Oh, God. Yeah. And then his body was dumped in the streets. Wow. I love that. Yep. No trial, no defense against yourself. Just, I heard right. that you did this. Well, some speculate, <laughs> as do I, that this was the work of Caracalla. 
His temper matched his father's quite closely. Only, Caracalla could not impose open hostility the way his father ah, did. Yes. He was too young and weak, p- politically anyway. Mm-hmm. However, if guilty of masterminding this, he managed to remove the strongest political rival he and his family faced. Julia Domna was now the only one whispering in Severus's ear about policy. And most importantly, Caracalla could now exile his young wife and be done with That's her forever. Right. The poor girl was sent away to an island to be forgotten. And but at she least was. She, uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thankfully, she wasn't executed along with her father. Right. With that out of the way, Caracalla, can ter- uh, Carilla, Caracalla carried on, is what I tried to say there, mm. as the junior emperor. In 207 CE, he celebrated 10 years of his reign. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The following year, he served his third consulship alongside once again, his brother. Geta. Yep. I'm sure they're getting along much better now. Mm-hmm. You had one man murdered. I'm sure you're just feeling good. You're like, That's, yeah, I'm good now. Right. We're on the same page. It's fine. For the sake of just wanting to talk about her just a little bit more, I'm going to mention now what Julia has been doing, mm-hmm. Julia Domna. So she's been gaining fame in her own right. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was one of the most public facing empresses of Roman history. Uh, she assisted her husband in the running of the empire and was very well loved by the people and the Senate. She mm-hmm. was their empress. Uh, interestingly, she also accompanied Severus on several of his military campaigns. Nice. Not at the front, obviously, but yeah. in the back, serving as the administrative leader. Um, something few empresses would ever care mm-hmm. to do, and most men wouldn't want their wives at the war with them. Right. But he had great respect for Julia Domina because she was an intellectual who got mm-hmm. shit done. For all her hard work and her devotion she was granted many honorary titles two of which are mother of the invincible camps for being there with the soldiers she was their mother and mother of augustus because she was the mother of a co-emperor yeah coins were minted with her likeness and her various titles also important to note julia domna had a sister that i mentioned last time and i'm going to be making another family tree of the severan dynasty like we did with mm-hmm. the julio claudians mm-hmm. and posting that but that's more important for Wonderful. next episode Okay. But today, we'll just remind you that Julia Domna has a sister named Julia Mesa, and she was also having some children during these years, two daughters who will become important in the future, Julia and Julia, of course. What? Both it's, daughters? Yeah, well, it's, it's I mean, because Julia Julia's Domna like, and Julia Mesa right. are, yeah, yeah it's, it's not like a first name. It's the not name the first name. Different. Different. Yeah. yeah, their last name is what they like go by, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I think Julia is their, I can never quite tell because sometimes it switches. Like sometimes mm-hmm. the like Severus of the Severan dynasties in the middle. Sometimes at the beginning, I don't know. I'm, hey man, they they did they did names weird. I'm not a I'm not a Latin name a lot kind of, of Julia's guy. You in know here, though. Yeah, lots of Julias, and they will become important. We'll be talking about a lot of Julias <laughs> for a little bit. <laughs> I'm gonna need that tree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll get one for you. So anyway, Severus saw that his sons were not getting along very well, and he was getting on in years. Mm-hmm. So this was only going to cause problems if he died his boys needed some real world experience before they took over themselves Mm -hmm. in whatever capacity that might be so when the caledonians started kicking up a fuss along hadrian's wall he jumped at the opportunity to return to the field soon the legions crossed the british channel with their two emperors and the backup heir a pretty risky play all things considered severus set geta up as the civil administrator of the empire while he and caracalla oversaw the fighting it was around this time in 209 ce that caracalla got some bad news it would seem julia domna's whispers in her husband's ear had paid off and severus declared that geta was now joint emperor with caracalla and himself oh three now i like that three let's just add more it, you know three's a party it's the only way to secure the severan dynasty's claim to the throne for sure how how else could this it's a way there's no <laughs> this is the best way 100 yeah, percent. yeah 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 <laughs> now after being sole heir since early childhood mm-hmm. the young man was likely furious oh yeah he's got temper he's mad so furious that he sought to bring about the downfall of his father uh-huh severus had been unwell for some time his gout was a constant agony and he was in his mid-60s by this point Doctors and attendants were constantly trying this and that to ease their leader's pain. Caracalla, on the other hand, started putting out feelers for which of the physicians might be willing to, I don't know, partake in some regicide, maybe. Pull him out of his misery. Yeah, he's suffering, That's please. Right. Uh, maybe maybe you could just 
slip this poison into <laughs> his food. It's mm? it's a kindness, really. Or maybe just don't treat him well. <laughs> like just let just him die. Let him decline faster. Please. Okay. <laughs> Much to Caracalla's annoyance, uh, none would bite at this offer. <laughs> It seemed everyone around Severus either loved him or feared him, and usually both. Mm -hmm. So, no, Caracalla realized, I will have to do this myself. Sometime in the final months of Severus's reign, a peace treaty or negotiation of some kind was sought with one of the more powerful tribes in Caledonia. Despite his agony, Severus mounted his horse and rode out to meet the enemy delegation with his son. It is unclear what Caracalla was thinking, but it was at this time that he decided to go for it. He drew his sword while behind his father in a situation where no one should be drawing swords. Yeah, you're like, what? Is, what's he... Hey, yeah, wh wait what a second. You, huh? And the surrounding Praetorians and attendants yeah. <laughs> shouted. <laughs> wow. Yeah, they uh, saw something mm -hmm. was amiss with the right. angry seems little dangerous. bastard. It seems dangerous. <laughs> Maybe don't draw your sword yeah. behind your father. <laughs> So they called out to Severus, who turned and saw his son sitting there on horseback with the sword in hand. Likely a bit, um, mm, well, uh, no, I was just uh, a bird over there yeah. and pointing. It's, it's a lot easier to point with a sword. It is, yeah. It's longer. That's kind right. of allows for More the accuracy. The angle is better That's if right. I can point a longer mm -hmm. stick. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'm sure he was saying all of this and Severus right. just stared at him. Yeah. Not angry. Yep. No shouting. And then he turned and continued on to the meeting, yeah. <laughs> saying nothing. That night, Caracalla was likely insanely nervous back at the camp. His father was a severe man who did not suffer treachery lightly. He had won his place as emperor through sheer force of will and cruelty, mm -hmm. after all. Mm -hmm. And then the summons came. That's right. Caracalla went to his father's quarters and found the aged emperor and the Praetorian prefect waiting for him. A sword lay on the table, and as we saw last time, Severus scolded his son for trying to murder him in front of the army. Yeah, he's like, if you're going to do it, do it. Just do it, not in front of everybody. <laughs> Show cohesion, and don't be a little bitch. That's right. But if you are a little bitch, why don't you have the prefect do it? Tell I won't stop him. Tell him to do it. Do it. Because Severus has balls of steel That's even right. when he's about to die. Yeah, he doesn't care. Yeah. So, Caracalla backed down. <laughs> He apologized for his foolishness. Oh, man, this guy's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> crazier than me. Oh, my God. I didn't know. <laughs> he was excused from the tent and was very humiliated. Mm -hmm. But he would have to wait for Severus to die on his own. Didn't take long. Not long at all. <laughs> February 4th, 211 CE, Severus died in York. His parting command to his sons was essentially this. Work together. Keep the army happy. Spite everyone else. Yep. A wonderful funeral pyre was constructed, and the army celebrated the life of their late liege well into the night. Um, interesting side note, 211, 211 CE is also the year Cassius Dio began writing his Roman histories. Ah. And at the end, it's kind of disappointing that it's at the end of Caracalla's mm -hmm. chapter that he mentions this, but he, Dio claims that Severus, I believe it was in a dream or actually, told him he needs to write the Roman histories. Oh. <laughs> so that could go on Severus's lasting legacy, it's I like, suppose. Hey, write this down. <laughs> yeah. Dio, Dio thought that Severus wanted him to write it, which is very cool. Yeah. And then he's like, and your son, man. <laughs> God. <laughs> anyway, uh, the ashes of Severus were then poured into the beautiful, pur beautiful purple urn he'd ordered himself. Ah. The plan was to wrap things up in Britain, and then both brothers would head back to the capital and inter their father. But Caracalla had other plans in mind. Almost immediately after the brothers ascended and were declared joint emperors by the army, Caracalla began plotting. He had been heir his whole life and would not take his little brother stepping on his power lying That's down. That's right. How do I get this all for myself? Exactly. First things first. He ordered the execution of those doctors who wouldn't <laughs> poison Severus. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, those doctors That's who were right. so inept, they That's brought right. about they the death of the young, fit, and healthy emperor. Exactly. He could have survived 10 more years with competent care. Yeah, if not for your lack That's of right. knowledge in the medical field. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Severus's attendants who looked down their noses at Caracalla, they had to die too. Yes. The soldiers and Praetorians were quite fond of Caracalla and so obeyed these orders without question. Like, okay. <laughs> Plus, lots of money still coming from the Severans, you know good stuff for the army and the praetorians one thing they could not get on board with was granting caracalla sole rule yeah 
He tried convincing the men that it was his right to be emperor and that his brother was a thief, but they had all known Severus yeah, and knew no. he had named Geta yeah, joint it, emperor. It was, yeah, Severus just said it, man. He, he, he It's two years ago. He yeah. said it two years ago. Like, we know that he he's right there. You he's, remember. Julia Domna, who might have been on this campaign, but I couldn't find out for mm-hmm. sure, uh, helped to put down these plans as well. Just like, just can you just share? Can you please just share? <laughs> she shamed her eldest son in a, against That's right. the plotting. That's right. And so the two emperors quickly made peace with the Britons and abandoned the war. Never again would the Romans try to conquer the rest of the island. Good. <laughs> well, they almost did it this time. I don't care. The, it would have literally just cost more money to maintain. They wouldn't have gotten anything out of it. it just, yeah, but what about the conquest? No. <laughs> well, what about that? Okay, yeah. They won no, the war right. and they were like, all right, we'll, we'll let you live. Yep. You just, you just stay there. So that no one... No Romans would ever try and conquer again. After two centuries of fruitless war, yeah. you jumped ahead here, Hadrian's Wall would become the permanent barrier in the north. The emperors then traveled back to Rome to inter Severus's ashes. Herodian says this journey back was very uncomfortable. <laughs> Both emperors lodged and dined separately, each taking cautions against poison. Yeah. <laughs> Their fear of one another was palpable. Dio Actively tells- saying, I want to kill my brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, not... Oh, sorry, As actively. actively. I mean, it, everyone sorry. knows, but like everyone, yeah. <laughs> Dio tells us that shortly after returning to the capital, Caracalla got upset at a famous charioteer. This man was apparently had apparently won 782 races in his career, which was a record no one had ever reached. Mm-hmm. Dio claims it was this man's fame and a disagreement with the emperor that led to his execution. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. An important note, uh, Geta and Caracalla... F- followed different sporting teams as well. As we've mm. mentioned, the reds, the blues, the greens, and the... Wasn't there purple and gold at one point? There were. I think there was Domitian, and then they got rid of them. Ah. I'm so bad at this. I should know more about these, but I don't care that much. But anyway, yeah. they didn't They didn't like the team. So Caracalla... Or they didn't like each other's teams. Caracalla was a blue. Geta was a green. Oh, boy. And these rivalries were real things, just as like mm-hmm. sporting team rivalries are today. So they really didn't like each other in any way. <laughs> Uh, despite the hostility between the two, Caracalla and Geta put on a face of cooperation for the public. But anyone who knew them on any personal level could see that this was never going to work mm-hmm. at all. Caracalla had made known his desire to kill his brother periodically for <laughs> years now. Severus and the legions had prevented this, obviously. But now there was no one but Julia Domna and Geta's supporters to stand in the mm. way. Still, the two got on with it for a while. Physical altercations grew more common. And eventually it was decided that the best course of action was to divide the palace in half. (laughs) Split it right down the middle. A barrier went up across the massive complex so neither party could get to the other's side. Uh, This could only possibly go well. It sounds like a great idea. Yes. Heads of state that cannot be in the same building as each other. Progress is sure to happen. Yes. Well, sides were being formed and solidified. As an international, as in international politics, one can never really stay neutral. If you don't side with Geta, then you are, by definition, mm-hmm. with Caracalla, uh, even if you don't agree with Caracalla. Right. But don't get it twisted either. Geta was trying to find ways to get rid of his brother, too. This was not a one-sided affair by any means. This rivalry soon got to the point where the two emperors were hardly ever seen together in public for any of the important stuff that needed to be done. As the political tensions rose, someone had a brilliant idea. Why don't the two emperors each take half the empire? <laughs> ah, are we going to get into east and west here? <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> so the plan was simple. Why don't we have Caracalla as the older emperor rule from Rome, have all the west, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then Geta can go out to the east, capital to be decided, do his thing out there. Maybe Antioch or Alexandria. Yeah. Beautiful cities. Surely this would be the smartest choice to save the empire from tearing itself apart. I, it went over so well. They did it. No fuss. They're like, oh, wow. Great idea. We're going to have perfect relations now. Well, no. <laughs> because at this time, Julia Domna spoke up again. Oh. I think it likely that she was still strongly pulling strings in the actual running of yeah, government probably. at this point. And was smart enough to know that this plan would fail. Yeah, it's like no, they're just they're just gonna fight each other. You're gonna go to war. Now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they'd each have an empire. Yeah, yeah. This is not a good idea. Nope. So she appealed to their love for her. Ah. She said, "If you split the empire, how are you gonna split me?" Oh. Yeah. This put line. An, yeah. This put an end to the talks of two empires. 
But still, something needed to be done. Mm -hmm. The government began to struggle under this rivalry. Official appointments were always contested. Geta wanted his loyal men in the role, and so did Caracalla. The courts were backed up as both men tried to get their supporters out of trouble or vice versa. And this was just not going to work. Mm-hmm. No one could figure out how to do anything because there was constant squabbling. So Caracalla was done with it. He reached out to his mother and made a request. Can you just get us both in a room together so we can talk this out? It's not going to go well. <laughs> <laughs> you went wide eye there for yeah. a second. <laughs> yeah. It was clear the major issue was that both sides were physically and politically separated. They uh-huh. hadn't been in contact this whole time that they'd been ruling together. So how could they ever make up? But neither trusted the other. Right. So, Mom, can it just be us? Can we just meet with you uh-huh, and uh-huh. get this sorted right. out? Right. Yeah, yeah. It'll be fine, I promise. So Julia approached Geta, who was naturally wary yeah. of this invitation. When his mother brought it up, he made clear that it had to just be the three of them. Mm -hmm. And she had to, like, make sure of that. No one could bring guards or friends because it would only lead to a fight. We all have to be naked to make sure there's no weapons. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Julia asserted or assured her son that Caracalla felt the same way and wanted the same assurances. The meeting would be in a location of her choosing, and it would be just them. And so it was. Geta arrived and found his mother and brother seated at a table in Julia's apartments, ready to hash things out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As he seated himself, he turned to look at his older brother and was horrified to see a broad smile upon his Uh, usually sour mug. Yeah. Without warning, several centurions burst Uh, into the room. Of course. Swords drawn. Yeah, naturally. Geta and Julia screamed and leapt to their feet. Geta rushed toward his mother and wrapped his arms around her like a frightened child. Frankly, don't blame him. This did not stop the men from cutting him to pieces. Right. And probably Julia. No, thankfully. Wow. She good, was she was injured. Accuracy. She was <laughs> injured, but she would she did not get killed. Geta screamed out to his mother as he was being slain, but she was frozen with shock. The murderers rushed from the room as Caracalla smiled down upon his dying brother. Julia Domna held Geta as he bled to death on the floor. Yeah, saw that coming. Alternate stories claim Caracalla did the stabbing himself. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised. He seems I wouldn't pretty either. sadistic. He, a little bit. A little bit. A little yeah. bit of a grumpy guy. Seems closer and closer to the guy on the horse. I don't know. I, I, just, I, think, you're, I think you're making broad assumptions here. Broad? Not that broad. <laughs> not that broad. Well, Caracalla could only relish his victory for a moment before he rushed out into the city, calling after his guards that he needed to get to the camp immediately. Mm. Screaming out. That he had been attacked. That's right. My gutta tried to kill me. He's covered in blood. Yeah. So this lends credence. And he was ushered into the camp where he informed the guards that, in fact, his brother had tried to murder him. That's right. Good plan. So he told the guards that he had killed Geta in self-defense. And Dio says that he finished his tale by saying, quote, I am one of you. It is on your account alone that I care to live. That so I may afford you much happiness. All the treasuries are yours that's right he tried to kill me so i killed him in defense look at all the money look at this <laughs> money that i have here oh and by the way the guards and the army will also be getting a pay raise on top of the one-time bribe that's right to remember i mean my i brother. mean payment no to remember my brother in remembrance it's what he would want no <laughs> no no and we will see why no well, we no, don't talk makes, about don't remember getta yeah no that makes here's sense. the money to not remember getta that makes sense because he did say he tried to kill me correct so i suppose you won't want to yes the guards were quite happy to accept this and <laughs> right, hey look well. we have a sole emperor again that makes it easier we only have to guard mm-hmm. one guy the day after the murder caracalla went to the senate to tell them what had happened he continued in the lie that he was acting in self-defense he went on to say that it was only natural for a man to defend himself even Romulus True. had slain his brother when Remus had insulted his wall. Right. Not what, a very good how argument. Dare you yell at my wall. <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to the modern ear, yeah. but the Romans still love their mythical Romulus. So, plus, Caracalla pointed out Geta had been trying to get his cupbearers to poison Caracalla from the lo- for That's a right. long time. Long time. That coming. sentence was poorly written. Like there were yeah. so many typos. <laughs> he, he conveniently left out that he'd been doing the same thing. Yeah. I, yes. According to Herodian, he concluded his speech to the Senate as such. 
It is your task first to give thanks to the gods that at least one of your emperors was saved by them. Mm. Next, you must put an end to sectarian feelings and partisan opinions and live an untroubled life looking to a single emperor. Then he glared really hard at all the senators he knew to be the supporters of Geta. That sorted, Caracalla now had a mess to clean up. There you go. What do you think that mess was? All, all of the supporters. We're going to make them disappear. Oh, yes. <laughs> As the sun came up, the Praetorians rushed through the city. And Dio quotes, The people and soldiers that had been with Geta were suddenly put to death to the number of 20,000 oh, men God. and women alike, where in the palace any of them happened to be. That's wild. Days of bloodshed followed. Yeah. Those who knew Geta were killed. <laughs> Those who supported Geta were killed. Those who had once shared a room with Geta were killed. Yeah, I ate breakfast next to him one time. Get him. Get, get him. him. Get him. Get hey, him. I think that guy like saw Geta in the street once. They walked down the street next to each other. I saw it. Hey, my mother-in-law, she loves <laughs> Geta. Like, dude. <laughs> hey, my neighbor with this giant complex. He had him over for dinner the other day, I swear. For the record, I love my mother-in-law. Step in there. Just got to put that out there. <laughs> I don't think she listens to this, but if she yeah. did, I just want you to know. Anyway. While they were at it, Caracalla told the troops to go ahead and loot the temples and mansions of the wealthy. Nice you know, well. so I can pay you all the money, I promise. Ah, yeah. For yeah. the kingdom. Sorry. For so, the empire. For the empire. We're not a monarchy. We're not a okay. monarchy. This is a republic. <laughs> That's right. Herodian again, quote, There was no mercy shown to young people, not even children. The corpses were subject to all kinds of indignities as they were dragged around, put on carts, and carried out of the city. Not a person survived who was even casually acquainted with Geta. One of the people caught up in the killing was one of the last children of Marcus Aurelius. Oh. Cornificia. Yes. I actually have um, the, the the sheet that we were writing on oh, with yeah, the children's yeah. names. There she is. Cornificia. Oh, I tried to spell it, huh? Yeah, you did. You Look sure did. <laughs> <laughs> so we can here. I'll just I'll cross her off for you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, no problem, bro. Oh, she's dead now. That's unfortunate. Yeah. yeah, she was born in 160, though. So she lived a life. Not yeah. a long one, you know, well, 40s or something, 50s. Yeah, and then you talk to the wrong person. Well, um, do you actually want to know why she was executed? Yeah. So this was uh, for the weeping incident. This was God. the horrible crime of weeping with Julia Domna for the death of Geta. How dare you? There will be no weeping loss. for no, that no, dead no. traitor. Yeah, this, that's right. This is a good thing. Yes. There are very tears good of thing. happiness, I swear. Yes. <laughs> I'm well, crying out of joy. <laughs> Julia Domna saw Cornificia's death, I hope I'm saying that right, and from that day forward maintained a stony face. I bet. She was not permitted to mourn the loss of her son. You know, I'm sure it went from uh, from her being like, ah, yes, I have I have control over my kids to being like, oh, I no. have no control over this one. <laughs> mm -hmm. And just for good measure, let's ex execute that pesky wife Caracalla exile back in the day. Yeah, just, yeah, get her out of here. No, just, doesn't like her. Yeah. Just yep. Oh so God. she just got executed. She's ran his <laughs> Soldier letter. showed up. She just shows up. Yeah. She's I got like know. guards on the island to make sure she doesn't escape and just get a letter one day. But right. it goes to her on accident. Yeah. And it's just like, <laughs> oh, huh. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was dark. Anyway, people were slaughtered in their homes, in the public baths, and in the forums. And of course, their properties were seized. That's right. This included cousins of Caracalla and powerful senators. No one was safe as the blood flowed through the streets of Rome. Not even the Vestal Virgins. Oh, no. Dio claims four were murdered or executed, as he might have put it. On top of all this bloodshed, Caracalla ordered the Senate to declare damnatio memoriae on Geta's memory. His coins were melted. His image was removed from paintings. His busts were destroyed. The name Geta was very common at the time. Oh, God. And it became clear very early on that... One had best not use that name. Yeah, it better become un uncommon real quick. Right. <laughs> In fact, it was now a legitimate capital offense to speak his name <laughs> if the emperor or someone who liked the emperor heard it. My God. The people, obviously, were not happy about all the murder in their city. I can't imagine why. Yeah. Well, Caracalla was a lover of the races and hoped that some, of, or some good chariot racing would calm everyone down. Mm -hmm. But he was wrong. Once assembled in the circus, the people began shouting against Caracalla's purge and demanding he stop. So what do you think Caracalla did? I mean, time to shut the doors and just kill some more people. In a fit of embarrassment <laughs> and fury, Caracalla sent the Praetorians out to deal with the rabble rousers. Oh, there you go. 
Now, only the ones who are causing a fuss, though, obviously. However, yeah. let's let's remember that the circus, where the races uh-huh. are held, is massive. Yes. Holding upwards of 300,000 people, mm-hmm. which is very large, even by modern standards. It was impossible to know who was hurling abuse at the emperor and who was not. That's right. So kill them all. Kill them all. Perfect. Easy. Uh, unless they had enough money or jewelry in that moment to pay their way out. That's then kill them good. all. Yeah. That's right. And so the slaughter continued. God. So that's good stuff. And um, just so you know, that's the first 10 months of his reign. Just murder. Well, everything that I just, that was from Severus's death to Geta's murder, God. 10 months. All oh, of that. Love that. That just happened. And I want you to know that is not the intro scene. It didn't sound like it. Good. <laughs> Good. So clearly the first year of Caracalla's rule was going poorly. Yeah, you could say. Yeah. He was or viewed- it was going great. You yeah. know, Caracalla was probably like, yeah, that's going all right. I think the army and the Praetorians thought it was going all right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. You're right. He was viewed by most of his subjects in Rome as a murderous tyrant who acted only in his own self-interest. Not yeah. to mention Kinslayer. Not sure. Good. Sure. As the purge came to a close a few weeks after Geta's murder, Caracalla began feeling a bit guilty. This is a trend we will see for the rest of his life. He does horrible things, apparently on impulse, and then endures regret for his actions oh, later. So he's just like bipolar. Yeah. <sighs> or just really immature. He's got and ca- extreme fits of rage that blinds him. And then he's like, yeah. ooh. Maybe I shouldn't Yikes. have done that. Yeah. <laughs> Still, that doesn't excuse his crimes. No. What Caracalla needed now was to get the people on his side. Mm-hmm. He had the military and the Praetorians, but uh, how do you get people on your side? How do you think uh, he did it? How do you think he did it? Well, something they could do going on past them for is, is just, you know, throw some really fun games, get the people to enjoy some festivities. Like, oh, here you go. Maybe maybe a hand. I want to say, like, give them some money, but I don't know if we would have done that. I don't know if they'd come to the games after but being slaughtered in the circus. You're right. You're <laughs> right. But they're going to be at different games. Different so, games. Not like last right. time. That's not. right. It won't be like last time. That's not what he did. Yeah. But he did something arguably better. Oh, okay. In 212, Caracalla announced his new constitution. Oh. Or edict. Okay. It's known as both. Yeah. It declared that all men of the empire who were not the recent victims of Roman conquests or a slave Mm -hmm. were now Roman citizens. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like bumps you up into a new class. It certainly does. Yeah. Uh, This is an important distinction Mm -hmm. because citizenship has been kept mostly for Italians and Greeks. Right, yeah, kind of like the, the main Higher part ups. of, yeah. Yeah, the people that are viewed as civilized. Mm, yeah, that's right. Exactly. Um, so aside from popular support, making the people happy, why do you think Caracalla might have done this? It is a fundamental change in government and society across the vast empire. Mm-hmm. Thoughts on why he would do this? Mm, no, he wants an influx of something. Oh, yes. That need to be citizens. Yep. I don't know what good, or why. Good call. Well, here's Dio's take. Quote, this was the reason why he made all the people in his empire Roman citizens. Nominally, he was honoring them, but his real purpose was to increase his revenues by this means, inasmuch as aliens did not have to pay most oh, of these taxes. Tax them. <laughs> okay, yes. okay. So non-citizens didn't get taxed as much? That's funny. Yes. In addition... <laughs> okay. Caracalla may also have been seeking more men for the legions. Oh, that's right, because non-Roman citizens weren't supposed to be part of the legions. Right, they'd be in the auxiliary forces, yeah, which yeah. there were a lot of. That's right, because we all know that only Romans, you know, can true, be legionaries, true born, can right? Be good fighters. Mm-hmm. Well, the civil wars were only about fifteen-ish years ago, mm-hmm. and the campaigns in Parthia and yeah, Britain, yeah. the there were armies probably looking a little, a little slim, a little slim, and they needed more eligible men. Mm-hmm. So. We'll discuss this edict and its impact a little bit more in our rounds at the end, but it is now in effect, and many thousands of people around the Empire were likely rejoicing. Yeah, they were like, yay! Wait? There is is benefits to being a citizen as well. Yeah, I mean, like, hey, you're a citizen. You pay me now, but... (laughs) Yep. By this point, Caracalla was very stressed out. He Mm -hmm. had had done a lot, and most of it was not that popular, at least with most people. Right. (laughs) He was still viewed very negatively for the murder of his brother. Uh, Julia Domna was doing her best to keep herself calm and composed around her son, careful never to show her grief. And not everyone was happy about this edict he had just put Mm -hmm. out. Uh, There were significant complaining in the Senate about this and that and blah, 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 blah. 
Caracalla was restless and uncomfortable. By most accounts, he continued feeling great grief for his yeah. wrongdoings. Soon, or some claim, he was even seeing Geta and his father walking <laughs> through the palace and saying things to him, He's threatening got him. Very high stress. Yes. He needed to get away. The life of a politician was no life for him. He was a soldier, as his father was. He'd grown up on campaign, and unlike Commodus, who'd grown up mm -hmm. on campaign with his father, he loved the lifestyle. On top of this, he knew, as Severus had known, that the key to remaining emperor in this dynasty was being close with the army. Yeah. To Julia Domna's great relief, Caracalla announced that he was going out on campaign. Oh, wonderful. She can, like, relax in the palace for a while. Yeah, and not be scared. of. She yeah, can cry yeah. a little, maybe. Well, right, and not just always be worried about getting murdered immediately. Right. As she was handling much of the day-to-day -day administrative duties, she was left essentially in charge of the empire. And the murderer of her baby boy would be away. Oh, good. Julia Domino's power at this time is questionable. We don't exactly know exactly how much she was doing, but Caracalla was still likely in charge, but letting his mom do mm -hmm. a lot of the boring stuff. Still, everyone felt like this was a big win. Caracalla hated being in Rome. Almost everyone hated him being in Rome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Win-win, man. Yeah. Go out there. Fight your wars. Do it. In the early months of 213 CE, Caracalla set off to the German frontier. The Alamanni were a confederation of German tribes who were causing issues in Raetia, a province directly north of Italy. The confederation had pushed through the fortifications and were pillaging the land. Mm. These were likely the fortifications built by Hadrian a long time ago mm -hmm. when he went around and built stuff. Between 213 and 214 CE, Caracalla moved about the northeastern frontier and handled a variety of issues. Some he dealt with by leading battles and skirmishes and defeating the invaders. And some he dealt with diplomatically. The series of little wars is poorly documented, so we don't really mm -hmm. know much detail. But it was a successful couple of years of campaigning, and Caracalla loved it. He enjoyed the soldier lifestyle immensely. He'd earn the troops' love by walking with them rather than riding or being carried. He also ate the same food as them rather than dining on expensive local cuisine. And he was there leading them to victory and paying them a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, paying them a lot of money and just also building the bonds of being there. Yep. Men like to them. follow men that they see leading, mm -hmm. you know. It is likely also around this time that he started wearing a cloak. Oh, there you go. It was a popular style up in Gaul at the time. A nice long cloak with a hood. Very nice in those drafty seasons in Northern Europe. Would you like to hazard a guess at what this cloak was called? I, I, I don't know, man. A Caracalis. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Like before that or after? That is the name of the cloak. Remember, this man is known as Antoninus. Oh, yeah. And we call him Caracalla. I said that last time, and I don't think I said it in, at the beginning of this episode. No. Nope. Sorry. He was born Bassianus. He changed his name to Antoninus. That's right. History knows him as Caracalla. And this is why. Because he started wearing a caracalis, a very popular or a very nice cloak mm -hmm. that he then popularized and eventually distributed to the populace. Ah. My copy of Herodian, Herodian has a note from the translator stating that this cloak was of German design mm -hmm. and that Caracalla then himself modified it and then distributed it to the plebs as like a social service. So that's so, right. Yeah, you either way. It's, no, 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 no. It's not a German cloak. Right. <laughs> it's a better one. Mm -hmm. And as uh, this young emperor went around for years wearing this cloak, it became his nickname. Mm -hmm. Though it is really unlikely that anyone ever called him that in his lifetime. Right. Yeah, he, yeah. Is, he has mentioned that by Dio near the end of his chapter, that that is a nickname some have started calling him. Mm. At this point, I would like to show you a bust of Caracalla, so you know who we are dealing with. Because he is an interesting looking man. <laughs> Ugly? Is that what you mean? No, oh. not at all. Look at that angry some bitch. Yeah, he's kind of interesting looking. Yeah, he has like a permanent scowl on his very square head. Yeah, it's very square. Yeah, and he looks chin like strap. his chin strap beard that actually looks okay because it's so full. Well, sure. It's like curly. It's a bust. Yeah. But he, yeah, he looks like a scary man. Yeah. And uh, he was a scary yeah. man. So I just wanted you to have an image of him. The listener might have seen his image on the thumbnail, but you, you need to know. Okay. Now I know. Unfortunately, there's no busts with the hood up. If I oh. ever get into like 3D design, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I might like just add yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you can see how you would look like an evil emperor mm -hmm. in a mm -hmm. movie wearing a hood. Like I imagine him as Anakin in episode three. Oh, there you go. Yep. When he turns his head back. Yeah. And, yep. That's, that is what I envision. Anyway, back to the wars in Germany. 
Caracalla had done quite well. New fortifications were going up at the places where the barbarians had broken through, and the immediate threats had all been handled. The Senate was actually quite impressed, so impressed that they granted him the title of Germanicus Maximus. Oh, there you go. There you go. Doing well, That's doing good. well. I think Maximus might be a bit much since, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, after everything that Marcus Aurelius went through, like, eh, you, you beat some tribes over a year. I fought him for 20. <laughs> like, Yeah, you know, eh, eh, this, that, whatever. Wonderful, he thought. Perhaps now I should return to Rome. Everything's all settled. Yeah, that'll be great. Well, but then he had a moment of clarity. Ah, he couldn't return to Rome. That's right, more war. Well, he had to go east. He he had not seen the east since he'd gone with his father all those years ah. ago, and he was getting more and more enthusiastic about Alexander the Great. Mm-hmm. Plus, there you know, administrative stuff needed to be done out in the east too. I guess blah blah blah. Julia Domino was saying something about needing to get work done. But anyway, Alexander the Great. Caracalla may have had a secret purpose for his eastward travels. Herodian mentions that the young man was seeking aid for some ailment at the various mm. temples of healing and medicine. He visited many of these shrines, uh, though it remains unclear what was bothering him. Clearly, he was healthy enough to travel and campaign for extended periods. There's also mention that he may have been involved in a shipwreck or close call during the early days of this adventure. His entourage set out, the, set out for the Danube region and then passed through Thrace in spring of 214 CE. Like the days of Hadrian, the emperor was on the move. Shortly into this endeavor, we are told that he, quote, suddenly became Alexander and commemorated him afresh in all sorts of ways. Kind of like the case of Commodus becoming Hercules, but way less real world implications. Mm-hmm. He didn't go like crazy. He just was kind of obsessed. <laughs> He just kind of felt like Alexander in spirit, I guess. That's right. I am Him. Alexander the yes. Great. Yeah. That's yeah, I me. Think so. yeah, yeah, no. Mm-hmm. That sounds right. Great. I, he's had a lot of names. He might as well be yeah, Alexander now, too. More. It's fine. <laughs> While traveling through Macedonia, he discovered a young man who could do some cool tricks, such as jumping on a horse in some mm. way that I guess mm-hmm. was interesting. Mm-hmm. When he asked the man his name, he replied, Philip. For those who do not know, Alexander the Great's father was King Philip II of Macedon, who really set his son up for later success mm-hmm. and is also famous in his own right. According to Dio, upon hearing the man's name, quote, he straightway bestowed upon Philip the whole series of exalted military honors and before a great while appointed him one of the senators with the rank of an ex-praetor. Just, just man, you can jump on a horse real good. What's your name? Philip. <gasps> <gasps> oh my God, you must lead my armies Elevate and be in the Senate now. <laughs> anyway, the retinue continued eastward. It would appear that around this time, Caracalla began keeping a couple elephants in his entourage. Wow. This was also, of course, due to the fact that Alexander kept mm-hmm. elephants with him. Yeah. He also stopped off at the ancient site of Troy. There he paid his respects to Achilles whose tomb was there, I guess. I don't know if that space actually exists. Because I b- hmm. thought the, I thought it was mythical. And that Couldn't there's like theories on where it might be. But who knows? Actually, I shouldn't say who knows. There's probably a lot of people who know. Yeah. And I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Along the way, Dio tells us he also began persecuting Arist- Aristotelian. It's Aristotle philosophers. Oh, okay, Aristotelian, okay. I believe. Sure. Aristotelian. Italian, whatever, philosophers. Yeah. Um, this is because Aristotle is believed by some to have taken part in Alexander's death. Oh. No idea what persecuting means in this context either, uh, but take that for what you will. Okay. Yeah. Hey, you. Stop that. There's all, I don't remember <laughs> if I put it in my notes, but since we talked about the elephants, um, he also kept lions. Oh. Yeah. Ooh. Like, like a plural. Cool. Yeah. And some he even like kept with him like around. <sighs> yeah. Very wild man. The emperor spent the winter in Nicomedia and left for Antioch in April of 215 CE. At some point during the year, he meandered his way south toward Alexandria, Mm -hmm. the city named for his beloved Alexander, along with the dozens of other cities named for the man known as the Great, because Alexander named almost every city after himself. Probably. And one after his horse. I mean, you know, when you conquer that much, might as well, right? Yep. Throughout his travels, he was doing proper administrative duties and overseeing that things got done well, even though he did not have a taste for it. Yeah, Right. By the winter of 215, he arrived at the gates of Alexandria. The citizens made a great spectacle at his arrival. The second largest city in the empire threw open its doors and welcomed their liege with great pomp and ceremony. It is estimated that half a million people lived there around this time. Wow. Yeah. And Rome was around a million. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this is a very large city for something so ancient. 
20 years earlier, the city had placed a sign over the gates that read, Welcome, Lord Niger. Oh. They had sided against the Severans during the Civil War. Was it War. still there? No, 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 no. Okay, good. They, they love Severus <laughs> now, remember? Yeah, Because yeah, yeah, yeah. he won. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But no matter. That's fine. After the grand entry, Caracalla thanked the people and the leaders of the city, and then he rushed off into the heart of the city. That's right. Time to party. Well, where do you think he went? Is that, I mean, is that where Alexander's tomb is Oh, at? yes. Okay. Yep. That's where he went. So he rushed off to the tomb. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, he'd been there before with his father, mm-hmm. but now he truly understood the power of this room. He viewed the tomb for a long time before draping it with his imperial purple cloak. Ah. Not his Caracalla cloak, obviously. No, no, no. Caracalla spent the next few months enjoying Egypt. Some administrative stuff got done, and he mingled with the intellectuals of the East. Despite his poor decision-making at times, Caracalla was like his father in his love for knowledge and learning. The usual sacrifices took place, and Caracalla saw some of the issues of the city had faced. Notably, a bit of lawlessness and a few riots over the last few months. Can't imagine. It was time for a little tough love to get things in order. By early spring the following year, things seemed to have been stabilized. A strong praetorian presence and the emperor himself being in town generally puts most on their best behavior. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Caracalla planned to leave in early March to head back north and east. He was in the process of setting up an invasion of Parthia. Let's go. Just like daddy. (laughs) But before he left, he joined once again in the local festivities. Almost the entire city came out to wish the emperor well as he set off. Then he called a meeting of the young men in the city center. Hmm. All of them. There was great excitement amongst the people. (laughs) What? You seem nervous. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Why? I do. I don't know. (laughs) What surprise does our brilliant young emperor have for us? I don't know. We've been partying for months. We gather as groups of people. It just hasn't gone well so far. Oh, calm down. (laughs) Calm down. (laughs) Thousands gathered together. Word soon got around that they were going to form up in a phalanx formation in honor of Alexander. Okay. How very exciting. Yeah. Many of the young men had brought their parents and other family to witness this day as it was being speculated and rumored that Caracalla might be recruiting for his upcoming campaign. Oh, okay. This was the chance to show that they were fit for service. See, you're getting nervous yep. about things that you ought not get nervous about. not going to stop getting nervous. So, <laughs> right. Caracalla walked up and down the assembled men, and Herodian tells us he gave encouragement to a good many of them as he went, and they flushed at the approval of their liege. After a short while, Caracalla returned to the front of the phalanx to address the people before him. It was only then that the excited young men realized that the soldiers had encircled them. Uh, Of course, of course. Caracalla rejoined his guards and gave a subtle signal. As the emperor left the area, the soldiers moved in and the slaughter began. Why? Why? This man is crazy. A quote from Herodian. They wiped them out with every kind of slaughter, armed soldiers against defenseless men who were totally surrounded. Some of the troops did the killing, while the rest outside the ring dug huge pits to which they dragged the fallen and threw them in until they were filled with bodies. Many people were half alive when they were dragged to the pits, and unwounded men were forced into the grave along with the rest. After the initial massacre of the young men and any who happened to be around, the (laughs) troops went out into the city and continued their rampage. Just just kill them. Yeah, just go kill people. Many thousands were slain that night, innocent people who had no idea what they had done to warrant their liege's fury. When it was all over, Herodian tells us the mouth of the Nile and the coast around Alexandria were red with blood. Probably not true, but it must have been a a horrific scene. Uh Shortly after the massacre at Alexandria, as it became known, Caracalla headed out. Time to go on that Parthian campaign he was so excited about. For clarity, much of what I described is from Herodian, who was not there. Um, as always, the show is about history, but told in the form of a story. We do not have details of what really happened in Alexandria. We know that he probably rounded up people in the center, and then those people were killed. And then a second kind of like random assault on the city took mm-hmm, place. Mm-hmm. It's about what we know. A lot of people died. Um, we're going to talk more about this in Terrible Tyranny, though, I was say too many and people. talk about the possible reasons for what happened. I was going to say, too many people named Geta lived in Alexandria. It's Don't bad, say that name. Don't time. say that name. <laughs> Just, I'm saying, too many people. He probably heard it and was like, huh, okay, and time to die. <laughs> yeah, right? Now you've probably guessed. That was the intro. Yeah. That's the massacre at Alexandria. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, as the blood pulled out of the city gates, 
Caracalla set off with his soldiers for the city of Antioch. Ah, after the slaughter, time for a war. Woo! Naturally. Good appetizer. Mm-hmm. He continued planning for his Parthian offensive. Something within him really wanted the title of Parthicus. <laughs> Still, he needed to cast his belly to declare war. Even back in those days, you can't just declare war on another nation. You need people to have a reason for it. Sure, yeah. Because I want your land. To achieve, well, right. <laughs> to achieve this, Caracalla made a political play. First, he reached out to King Volagases VI of Parthia to demand the release of a couple prisoners. Volagases refused on several occasions leading War. up to yes. 216. Well, yes. However, Volagases was soon overthrown by King Artabanus. Artabanus? The fourth. Oh, man. Artabanus is going to be reasonable and be like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. He did, yeah. 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 So he released them, knowing that it would be the safest. But Caracalla then had a new ploy. Yeah. What if uh, I marry your daughter, King Artabanus? I need a wife. The 28-year-old emperor had been without a wife for some time. Yeah, uh, he, he needed to start need making heirs. Yeah. Yep. So, and also, how about a fresh start here, Artabanus? Like, I didn't uh, like Volagassis, neither did you. How about we be, be friends? He's setting you up, bro. Well, He's obviously, you up. yeah. Artabanus <laughs> was not an idiot. Uh, he knew the real play here was to bring the Parthian state under Roman control mm -hmm. by giving the princess to the emperor. Right, right. It would also add significant amounts of land to the empire and remove their greatest rival. So, no. Obviously, Caracalla never expected this to be accepted. Mm -hmm. The rejection did allow him to declare war, however. Wild. Which was his goal the whole time. Now, this is Dio's telling. Herodian has a bit more flair in his tale. According to him, Artabanus eventually accepted the proposal because he just kept being like, please, please, how about I marry your daughter? Please, please, can I marry your daughter? Please. Uh, and probably not saying, please, I'm going right. to marry your daughter. Yeah. I'm going to marry your daughter. Mm -hmm. I'm going to marry your daughter. But once the, med uh, once the wedding was underway, Caracalla had the wedding massacred. Ah, good. Yeah, yes. to me, Dio's version seems way more realistic. Um, would you let Caracalla come to your no. land with soldiers to marry your daughter? Right, yeah. No. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Especially literally months after Alexandria. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, even if they didn't somehow hear about it. Still wouldn't, yeah. St you still wouldn't do that. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. like you said, all you lose all political power. Right. And yeah. you don't let someone march troops into your land. Yeah. You just don't do it. <laughs> Either way, uh, Caracalla marched troops into Parthia in the middle of 216. This was the climax of Caracalla's campaigns over the last few years. He pushed first into several client states of the Parthians to help destabilize the area. After these quick victories, he marched into the northern parts of the Parthian Empire. Slaughter was the name of the game. Mm -hmm. Every town and city they encountered was savagely looted. Someone just needs to kill this man. He just needs to catch an arrow to the knee. Let me tell you. But he's out adventuring still. I know. Yeah, Dio shares that in one of the major offensives of the year, Caracalla dug open the tombs of the Parthian kings oh. and scattered the bones and ashes oh, around man. so they would be lost to time. It was a nasty business all over Mesopotamia, and Artabanus was furious, mm -hmm. obviously. The Parthians were wise and did not engage Caracalla's legions in this first year. They weren't ready. They had just had like a mini civil war a coup essentially and were not prepared to fight the legions in open battle instead they hid in the mountains and gathered their strength the country was obviously unstable from the recent overthrow of their king mm -hmm. and it would take them time to organize a resistance but in the meantime slaughter ensued across part of their nation as winter rolled in caracalla pulled back to edessa plans were already being drawn up to push further in the next campaigning season uh, but while they waited caracalla sent word to the senate the Parthians were defeated. He had been campaigning yeah. in their lands all year, and not a single army tried He's to like, stop yeah, him. Yeah, no, we won. They're, we're yeah. done, dude. Like, we'll go clean up next year, but it's over. Oh you can give me the title of Parthicus now if you want. Arrogant. Yeah. He was granted the title of Parthicus oh, Maximus. Here like, yep. you go. <laughs> Despite this, he made plans to continue conquering Parthia, even though he was the conqueror yeah, of Parthia. He already did it? Yeah. That's impressive, honestly. Yeah. Well, by April of 217 CE, the army was just about ready to head back out into the right, field, right. and then Caracalla died. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and we'll look at that into far more detail in Departing oh Demise. God. But I'm uh, glad he's dead. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so, my God. <laughs> so were several other people, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, most of them. Yeah. But uh, it was probably about as surprising to him as it was to oh, a man. lot. Oh, man. But now we got to look at Oh, boy. Big power vacuum. 
Oh, this yes. will be exciting. Oh, yes. This is <laughs> oh, yes. The end of another dynasty. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, no. What, what do you mean, no? What do you... I, did I not mention that I'll be giving oh, you a severing right. family tree? You're right. That's right. She had a sister. There's a lot of other kids there. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Okay. But we have a lot to get through <laughs> <laughs> after this. So uh, I, I have it written here. What do you think of Caracalla? But I think I just heard what you think of Caracalla. <laughs> I'm just glad he's dead. Yeah. Man All right. A psychopath. Let's rate this man. Mastery of military might. Negative three. <laughs> Well, Mastery of Military. Sorry, not, not this one specifically. Yeah, okay. This is going to be a good score for him. Yeah, it'll, it'll probably be all right. So he was campaigning with his father from an early age, mm -hmm. spent the first few years of his adult life in Britain fighting against the Caledonians, and he was out there with Severus leading the troops. After becoming sole emperor, he realized he much preferred the military life to that of the emperor at home. Uh, with some incursions by the Germanic tribes becoming a real issue, Caracalla went out, personally led his men against them, he was loved by his troops for living the lifestyle with them. Like I said, he ate their food and endured their mm -hmm, hardships. Mm -hmm. And he paid them a ton of money. Right. Plus loot from all the wars. That's right. He found great success in these Germanic wars. They were smaller scale than the Marcomannic wars by far, but still very important. And he proved himself an able diplomat in that sense as well. He secured peace with several tribes without resorting to fighting. When battle was joined, he was able to win quite often. We don't have great detail. But clearly, after victory, he reinforced the borders so they could be more effective at defending against the barbarians. And there was something about like the next 20 years where essentially those barriers were good mm. because they were just so solid. All along the Rhine and the Danube, he was building fortifications like Hadrian had done. His troops cleaned up problems across the northeastern border before heading to the Near East and amassing for the push into Parthia. There was the small detour to Alexandria. Um, but then he rushed in and looted and burned his way through Mesopotamia. He faced little to no resistance that first year. Because he's so good. Because he's so good. The plans were made for the rest of the war, but Caracalla died before they could be implemented. And some sources say that he realized that Artabanus was amassing a huge force to mm. fight the next season and was terrified of it. <laughs> but those sources don't like him. Yeah, so, and I don't know how they would know since he was since he was out there. Right. Yeah, but, and then he died, and then he right. died. So anyway, but yeah, that's basically it. He was an able uh, soldier, an able leader. Um, did just fine. I think. Oh man, less than his dad by far. Right. What did he give his dad? Um, I was ill prepared. I'm pulling it up now. Everything. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> Everything to know you're just like, hey man. Ah, the next thing. Ah, yes, I'll pull it up. <laughs> yes. Well, here we are. Severus got a 19. Okay, yeah. So I was thinking somewhere around a six or a seven. For I me. was also. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. Maybe a seven. He didn't really. He didn't really suffer like defeats until he, until he died. Right. He didn't have major battles though. Yeah. Yeah. I think I might give and him most a five. A five. Because he was solid, but did nothing. Of, yeah. I suppose most of his. Uh, battles were were like small villages or like smaller groups of people yeah there was there was no and he didn't have a civil but he war just walk or, over right all right i'll go with a six okay i'll give him a five so that is an 11 for mastery of military mites about half what his dad got i'm sure he'd love that suck it nerd terrible tyranny Oh, okay. <laughs> this is going to be a good score. Yeah. This one. Yeah. So let's remember that Severus oh. had openly declared that Caesar and Pompey had been mistaken in granting amnesty to their enemies yeah. in public to the Senate. Right. He praised Augustus for brutally suppressing yes. resistance. Uh huh. And that clearly wore off on his son. Um, he may have attempted to kill his father in front of a lot of people when he was around 20. He also may have been trying to convince Severus's doctors to let him die or to hurry the process mm -hmm. along. When Severus did die, he executed many of those people. Mm -hmm. Immediately after becoming joint ruler with Geta, he sought the military's support to have a coup. The military's devotion to Severus uh, had prevented that, and Julia Domino was also there trying to keep the peace. The situation back in Rome was so tense that the brothers had to have the palace bisected, which caused great issues with administration imagine. and everything else. And it was all because they just couldn't get along. He then murdered his brother mm -hmm. while he clung to his mother for help, whether he did it with his own hand or not. That's right. Entirely his fault. Um, afterward, his mother was not permitted to mourn her son. Yeah. Or anyone else. In fact, saying get his name was a capital offense. Yeah. After lying to the Praetorians and the nearby legions about what had happened, he paid them to stay on his side. And then the first massacre occurred. 
Supporters of Geta, their friends, their families were all cut down in the streets and in their homes. Days of bloodshed followed. Senators were no safer than plebeians. Dio tells us that a man named Silo, whom is referred to... Silo Brim. What's a guy? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Silo Brim? Is that a thing? Uh, He's a guy. Stilo. Stilo Brim is a... It was a... A commentator on ridiculousness. Okay. <laughs> I was like, did I miss something <laughs> no, no, here? No. <laughs> okay. So CeeLo uh, is referred to as Caracalla's nurse. Um, okay. I assume it tutor something, yeah. something like that. Um, so Caracalla apparently sent his men to kill CeeLo for some reason, mm-hmm. probably to get his money. They were supposed to loot his fortune and do horrible things to him. Quote, the men rent his clothing open and disfigured his face so that the people and the soldiers stationed in the city made clamorous objections. Caracalla, then seeing that the crowd was turning against him, jumped in and shielded the wounded man and (laughs) said, quote, insult not my father, strike not my nurse. Those who have plotted against him have plotted against me. He then what? ordered the men whom he had sent yeah, like, what? to what? do this job be executed. <laughs> this might have been because he wanted CeeLo oh killed quickly and quietly, not brutally mutilated in the streets. Right. Okay. Right. No, I think he was just like, oh, they're not as sadistic as me? Yeah. Fine. Okay, <laughs> fine. Um, he enjoyed watching gladiatorial combat. One famous fighter named Bato, he forced to fight three men in a row until he finally lost oh and God. died. <laughs> yeah. Dio says he had a massive stockpile of poisons from all around the known world. Quote, in order that he might secretly kill in different ways great numbers of men. Ah. After his normal. death, these poisons were found and burned. Yeah. That sounds like a good idea. Yeah. Uh, he would kidnap or arrest slaves and freedmen working for important and powerful people. They were then tortured and asked if their masters loved or hated the emperor. During his wars, he was also known to be particularly aggressive and violent. Uh, yeah. Cities didn't have much left after he went through the area. Well, no, burn them to the ground, take all their stuff. Yep. And scattering the bones of Parthian kings is also pretty terrible. Yeah. I will remind that um, Dio doesn't like him. Uh huh. And neither does Herodian. Okay. So just so you know, some of this might be a bit over the top. Even at a minimum, the it's things that he good. did. <laughs> still not yeah. good. Yeah. You know, and honestly, we'll actually, we'll talk about that in a moment. It's in, it's a later part of my script. But first, massacre at Alexandria. Possible reasons. It was planned from the beginning to stamp down on the rising crime rate in the city. Oh. There had been riots and destruction of property, like I mentioned. Number two, the people there had mocked him for the death of his brother while he was visiting perhaps putting on a satirical play about the event, not realizing or not caring Oof. that he was not okay with that. I don't know. I really feel like the massacre in Rome would have gotten out. Right. You know, One would suspect. Yeah. Alternatively, number three, the people of the city had been satirizing the murder of his brother and making mockery of Julia Domina previously, and mm. he knew about it. So this was all planned yeah, when yeah. he came. This would have been going on for a couple of years between Geta's murder and Caracalla's arrival. Mm -hmm. So might have been a festering thing. Dio also points out that his men were well rewarded for carrying out this massacre that had gone on for days. Quote, Caracalla was present and looked on and personally took a hand. To um, punish the survivors of this... He abolished games and celebrations in the city. And then the city was also ordered split up into villages to weaken it politically and financially. Wow. A final quote on this. He slaughtered so many individuals that he dared not even speak about the number of them, but wrote the Senate that it was of no interest how many of them or who had died, for they all deserved to suffer this fate. Of the property, part was plundered and part destroyed. That's right. Hey, man, I killed all of the traitors over here. Don't worry about the number or who. I just I got rid of the bad guys. It's fine. They're gone and, now. And I divided it up a little bit because they got too powerful. Yeah. Now, there are a surprising number that I saw who are kind of Caracalla apologists. Wild. That think he got a bad rap. Um, some claim he meant to send a message with the slaughter of the men in the first thing. Okay. But then the massacre of the rest of the city was the result of subordinates getting out of hand. Okay, I are don't you, buy you that saying, but are you still saying that that was an okay thing to do? Right, and <laughs> like, it didn't like. I mean, was it that bad? Who's just trying to kill all the young men to send a message? Right. 
oh yeah it's rational yeah, yeah. that sounds right a, me- a message that they d- and they didn't even know what what yeah. they're being punished for and yeah and even if that is true it's like well but you ordered a massacre and then couldn't control your men so that's not your fault ah. like i don't even yeah like, no all of not it a, yeah none all of it's it. bad chris scar the author of the textbook i use mm-hmm. for research uh takes this kind of apologist approach where he's like i think you go to bad rep and i don't i don't know man I, I, everything i saw like like you said even if only part of it's true like he murdered yeah, his even brother at the minimum yeah it's he oh, terrible. slaughtered get his supporters we yeah. know these things happened the out the massacre out you know how many emperors have massacred alexandria one yeah like <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it's not a regular thing that happens sometimes right anyway uh, i say 10 yep easy 10 yeah easy 10. easy 10 yeah big easy this man's psychotic yeah he's not he's he's an interesting one is caracalla but let's look at Lives of the Living. Eh. So Couldn't let's look at the prose. Right? Now, the Constitution of Caracalla. Yeah. Uh, the, it's actually the Constitutio Antoniniana. There you go. Which is the Constitution of Antoninus. Um, this is the edict that granted citizenship mm-hmm, to almost mm-hmm, all the men mm-hmm. in, the, in the empire. I don't know how women worked. I don't know if women got citizenship, but for sure the men. It's a good question. They might have. I should research more because i'm the, the host mm-hmm, anyway mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um we could consider this a pro or a con uh, or both in many for ways the people yep. specifically i think is a pro and that's my next line it's likely a big yeah. step up in society right but when everyone takes a big step up d- did anyone average down yeah. right did anyone really get it plus now they need to pay more taxes sure but you know. for everyone who took that step up, I'm sure it was great. Yeah, I'm sure it's happy. Now, aside from the massacres, there was stability in the empire. Somehow. For the six-ish years. Um, <laughs> the invasions by the barbarians were held back, and the fortifications were reworked. So no, And then no major uprisings took place, nor famines or major disasters. Um, he traveled around the empire and oversaw improvements to the administration. He held court and took care of the basic needs of a monarch, though he didn't like doing that much and often didn't and would like fuck with the Senate mm-hmm, by like mm-hmm. not showing up when he said he would. And right. Then, yeah. <laughs> Julia Domna did a good job of shoring up what he was missing as a leader. Quote, she gave him much excellent advice. He entrusted to her the management of the books and letters both, save the very important ones. So she was doing quite a bit. He also mentioned her in his formal addresses to the Senate, where normally he would declare that the emperor and the army were safe. He also said his mother was safe. Ah. Yep. So that's nice. Now the cons. Yeah. Only a couple. More quotes here from there. Dio here. He had also this most frightful of characteristic that he was fond of spending money not only upon the soldiers, but for all other projects with the one sole end in view. To strip, despoil, and grind down all mankind and the senators <laughs> by no means least. If I had to guess, I'd say Dio was being hyperbolic there. A little there. bit, yeah, yeah, probably. His point being, he just spends money because he wants to piss us off. Mm-hmm. He ignored the Senate and did not care what they thought. Another quote, I know that my behavior does not please you, but the reason for my having arms and soldiers alike is to enable me to disregard anything that is said about me. <laughs> Well, I, okay, well. At, like his dad got said. got a good point. <laughs> keep the army happy in spite of everyone else. Although he did not get along with his brother, which was the first thing his dad said. Right. Either way. He was responsible for at least two major massacres in his short reign. Many innocent people were brutally murdered at his command simply to fulfill his desires. Either the desire to be sole ruler or desire to get revenge against the populace. Uh, he was a man with a temper who was not opposed to using violence when he felt insulted. For the majority of his reign, he was out of the capital and had no desire to return. So that's uh, Lives of the Living. I think it's kind of in the middle where for anyone who wasn't being massacred, things were okay. I'm still, I think I'm still going to go with like a three because you're just living with the fear. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine the relief that they had when they found, oh, he's dead. (laughs) The one that was just murdering thousands of people at a time. Everyone. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The fear they lived with. So you want a three. Yeah, I do. Okay. That's wild. I can't imagine living somewhere like if our government was just like, yes, we just, that stadium of people, we killed them. Yeah. But don't worry about it. I was thinking about it today uh, <laughs> while I was like walking Zuko and like thinking about this podcast. Mm-hmm. I'm like, man, the number of like 
you must have known people back yeah. in those days who were executed. 100%. Like regular. Like most yeah. people knew someone, at least tangentially, who was executed. Yes. It's crazy. That's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> like that's just gotta, insane. That knocks that down hard. Yeah. I think I'll give him a five, Ugh. but I understand your three. I just think on the whole, most people were doing Psychological okay. damage. Yeah. There was, a conti- there was a continuation of government that left most people unaffected unless you were a supporter of Geta or lived in Alexandria. Mm-hmm. So, but I think a three is valid as well. So that is an eight for lives of the living. Departing demise. All right, let's see okay. how he died. Who murdered him? Okay, so Caracalla's death likely came as a surprise to the listener because it was very abrupt. Right. And he was only 29. So uh, let's take a closer look at what was going on in the background. So Caracalla and his legions were wintering in Edessa. Mm-hmm. Ever the inquisitive emperor, he was very into astrology and seers, soothsayers and stuff, just like his father. As he had free time while they waited for spring, he began speaking to soothsayers about what his future held. Who, how would he die primarily, and was anyone plotting for the empire? One Egyptian named Serapio, which is probably not how you say it because that sounded Italian. A little bit. Yeah. But uh, declared that Macrinus would overthrow the emperor. <gasps> He said this to Caracalla's face. Oh, you died, man. Which was bold. That's unfortunate. <laughs> well, you might be asking yourself, who is Macrinus? <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Macrinus was one of the two Praetorian prefects oh. at this time. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you just set them up for murder again. <laughs> what, are you, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> right. So, uh, not only that, he was an equestrian. Okay. Okay. So, that is probably what saved Macrinus's life at this point. Oh. Because Caracalla's like, he lo- this man is that. obviously a fool. Uh, yeah. An equestrian can't be emperor. That'd be, that'd be silly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. The man was thrown into a pit with a lion. Yes, that sounds right. Uh, this probably put Macrinus a bit more at ease, who was like, oh, what? Wait, he said, what? Me? He I said, didn't... no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Dare uh, you? <laughs> yeah. The Severans were not known for tolerating disloyalty. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Caracalla was far from, uh, it was far more vicious than his father had yes. been. <laughs> but to Macrinus's horror, the seer merely raised his hand and the beast did not harm him. Oh. <laughs> what do you think happened next? Well, uh, throw throw the guy in there. Macrinus? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, okay. Macrinus, or maybe someone else, executed the man personally. Oh, just kill him. Yep. Nope. Can't have you lying about stuff like that, bro. That's right. Can't have you lying about stuff like that. Uh, there would be no more talk about this bookish prefect becoming emperor. That's what he was. He was, there are two types of prefects, generally. There was the more military side, mm-hmm. running the actual troops, and then the admin side. guy. Yeah. Yep. And then they're both there to kind of check each other's power. Yeah. Still, Caracalla was a paranoid man, as one would expect. So he reached out to his urban prefect. Mm. Or maybe not, but the guy he'd left in charge of Rome while he was gone. Yeah. Because Julia Domna was out east with him. He requested the best seers be found and to have them read his fortune. Find out what uh, if there was anyone he needed to worry about. Just go, oh, you know. Man. Could you imagine the power that you held in your hands as a seer? <laughs> right <then>? Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. you know he's just going to murder whoever you say to worry about. Yes. <laughs> like, Correct. <laughs> But I mentioned Julia, and then my next line was, we have not spoken about Julia ah, <laughs> in yes. the latter half of our tale. Last we saw her, she was running some things back in Rome mm-hmm. while Caracalla went off to deal with the Alamanni. But you will remember that Julia used to accompany her husband on campaign. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She dealt with logistics and admin work. Uh, we have no record of her being on the German campaign. She probably stayed in Rome. But she was certainly out east with Caracalla by this point. She was stationed in Antioch and dealing with the usual admin stuff. And according to Dio, she was handling the correspondences for her son. Okay. Sort through all the unimportant information and send the vital stuff to the front, essentially. One day, a letter arrived to her from the capital. A a soothsayer from Africa had been talking. A lot. (laughs) He was saying things uh, that were most disconcerting, primarily that... um, Macrinus and his son would one day rule. Oh, no. Yeah. The urban prefect had ordered the man brought to Rome to be questioned. The most important question was, will you take back what you said about Macrinus becoming emperor? Yeah, right. He said no. Oh, man. So they tortured him. Oh, man. A lot. Mm -hmm. 
and demanded he recant. He just stuck to his guns. He refused. Macrinus is going to die. <laughs> it was the truth, and he wasn't going to lie. Oh, man. And so, Julia Domna found herself in Antioch reading the prefect's report that was supposed to go straight to right. the emperor, yeah. but the emperor had said, send everything to Julia. Yeah. However, the urban prefect was not the only one in Rome who knew about this prophecy. A man named Ulpius Julianus was likely loyal to Macrinus and sought to send him warning. Mm. It was clear Macrinus's life was forfeit. Yes. The second, this second prophet right. declared like, oh, that well, he would become emperor. Nice. So Ulpius sent his own letter straight to Macrinus with this warning. I'm paraphrasing. A letter is en route to Caracalla that is essentially your death warrant. Good luck. Hope you don't die. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> it is obviously unknown if Macrinus had any intention of doing Caracalla harm. Mm-hmm. He was an equestrian who had climbed to the highest position he could reach, Praetorian Prefect. But what is a prophecy if not a self-fulfilling prophecy? I guess. Macrinus now knew that he needed to act quickly. The letter for Caracalla was almost certainly in Julia Domna's possession or otherwise on its way to him at this moment. Mm-hmm. As it happened, there was a man close to the emperor who might just be willing to help Macrinus remove him. Ah. Julius Martialis, Martialis, Martialis. It's like Marshall IS. Okay. So I'm going to call him Martialis. That's Perfect. not how you say it, but I'm going to say it. Was an evocati serving in Caracalla's legions. Now, I made a same face you did there. Yep. Where I was like, what is that? What is that? But it is a soldier who had served his full term. Oh, okay. And then retired and then got asked to come back oh, okay. for some reason, for some service. Well, it's probably because they were lacking in men and well, they needed more experience. But these are high up. Like, this is personal guard stuff. Basically, an experienced soldier. Macrinus knew that Martialis had a significant grudge against Caracalla. Very recently, Martialis's brother had been executed by the emperor. There you go. Herodian says the charges against his brother were false. Caracalla was also growing hostile toward uh, Martialis as well. Martialis may have been summoned to his position, called out of retirement, by Macrinus. Mm. So, because he's got kind of a negative view on Macrinus right now because of the first prophecy, he also doesn't like Martialis, who might also have been requesting a promotion and was denied. Mm. When Macrinus approached Martialis and a couple of disgruntled Praetorians, he was happy to find that they were on board with his plan. Perfect. On April 8th, 217... Hmm? I said, let's get him. Let's get him. On April 8th, 217C, Caracalla was traveling to Carhai. We discussed this place in our very first episode. Oh, my God. This was where Crassus of the Triumvirate lost against the Parthians in 53 BCE. Might have had gold poured down his throat. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. However, Caracalla was feeling unwell as he headed to this ancient landmark. This might have been related to the unknown ailment that he was suffering or he was just sick. Some stories, he just needed to pee. <laughs> Either way, he called a halt to his entourage and set off to the side of the road to do his business. Mm. The guards and other followers turned away out of respect and because very few people in this world want to witness someone having diarrhea. Martialis, however, calmly <laughs> dismounted his horse. Ah, yes. He strolled toward the emperor as if nothing were amiss. With the speed of an experienced soldier... He drew his blade and stabbed the 29-year-old emperor several times. There you go. In a blink, he was fleeing. Get him out of here. In one tale, a Scythian guard quickly knocked an arrow and brought the assassin down. Oh. Another version says he evaded capture, but forgot to drop the sword, and so was quickly identified. That, what? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I mean, panic, stress. I guess. It could happen. Regardless, Martialis died. And the emperor soon bled to death out there on the eastern edge of the empire, far from the capital... And with no heir. Good. He had reigned for six years, two months, and two days, Too according many. to Dio. Yeah. <laughs> uh, plus the many years that he yeah, was technically he was serving. Co-heir. Yeah, with or his dad. Ruler. Where yeah. he wasn't in charge. Right. So I've chosen a narrative there somewhere between Dio and Herodian. Mm-hmm. Uh, as usual, these accounts are mostly hearsay. And Dio's tale is almost certainly propaganda. Um, but this is what we have to go with. So, Yeah. I think it's pretty interesting. There's a lot going on potentially in the background, and then an assassination takes place very rapidly to cover up potentially more murders. Mm-hmm. So, and it all happened out. He was pooping. Long time coming. Yep. Yeah, so that so that's fun too. Um, he was also surrounded by the most loyal people 
in his empire, which are his soldiers and his Praetorians, as he died. Most of them still were loyal. Mm -hmm. So just a really, really well-laid uh, assassination that worked great. I'm thinking between an 8 and a 10, and I don't know where I want to go. Mm. I was going to go with the 7. 7, you think? Yeah. So let's see. More Mostly because it's like not surprising. It is, but it isn't because of how terrible he was. Like it's only a matter of time. Right. Somebody's going to murder you. Yeah, but does that... I mean, someone was going to murder Commodus, but we still gave him a 20. Sure. I would... Is his... Now, so Commodus is interesting because he was poisoned and then went to the bath and then his wrestling buddy came out and strangled mm -hmm, him. Mm -hmm. Here he was, thinking he was in the safest spot he could be, pooping on the side of the road, surrounded by guards, stabbed to death. 7.1. So... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, after the first episode, I, I decided we won't be doing half points, but yeah, that wasn't a half a point. That was a, tenth oh yeah, of a point. yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> tenth of a point. Okay. I'm going to give him, I'll go, I'll go with eight. No more. Okay. I'll, I'll match an eight. your eight then. I think that's fair. Give him an eight. Wait, why is it less interesting than I'm going to give him a nine. Okay. Just a, so that's a 17 for departing demise. Cause I find that quite interesting. Lasting legacy. Okay. So, uh, Caracalla's constitution. Now, the uh, historian from the late 1800s, Gibbon, believes Caracalla set about a degradation of the military by adding more citizens to the legions. Thus, having fewer men in the auxiliaries who were mm. non-citizens. Legionaries were paid more. Oh, okay. A lot more. Yeah, yeah. And now they're being paid significantly more after Severus and Caracalla raised their pay to keep them happy. So much. Yeah. So much. One way of getting citizenship you in the past was to serve a full term in the military. I'm not sure what that term was. I think it was about 20 years. Sure. That's just off the dome. But afterward, you got some land, citizenship, and then that passed on to your children. Mm. So boom, yeah. it's, a really, it's a great incentive to join the legions. Um, granting citizenship to everyone uh, for free meant enlistment might have decreased over the following century. On top of that, as I said, he... I don't remember if it was doubled or increased by half, but uh, massive pay raise mm -hmm. for the soldiers after they just got a massive pay raise when the empire doesn't really have that much money. Right. They're not broke, but like th you can't keep paying people that yeah. much. And this is now leading in massively to what will become the crisis of the third century <laughs> that we keep talking about. We you are very you rapidly spending a lot more money than you're bringing in. That's a problem. Yeah. And huh. then when people say you should stop spending money, he goes, but I have soldiers. Why would I stop <laughs> spending money? That you're is like, what he said to his mother at one point. You're like that. It's unrelated. Right. To money. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, a physical thing that um, he's known for are the baths of Caracalla. Hmm. This math, uh, this massive public bath complex was begun likely in the last years of Severus's reign and completed around the end of Caracalla's. They were the largest bath complex in Rome for a while before becoming the second largest. Uh, after 300 years of operation, they fell into disuse and began to crumble away. Their architecture, though, served as a foundation for later baths and a basilica, as well as the Pennsylvania Station in New York City. So, and they're still, the, the, ra the ruins are still there. So there's that. Um, the massacre at Alexandria goes down as, you know, a horrific event. Right. Um, Remembered. <laughs> yep. Started up a, a war between the Parthian and Roman empires that he then died during the middle of. So a little bit of a legacy. Obviously, as we've said, there's, you know, most of these people at this point, no one's heard of in the modern day unless they're fans. Yeah. Um, but he does have a legacy and it's a bad one. Right, yeah. It's like, it's a legacy. It's just not a good one. Yep. It's still a legacy. Sure is. Uh, Six? More than half? Yeah. Because uh, he's definitely impacting strongly into the decline now. Oh, it, yeah. Like, all of Big his time. decisions are going to be impactful. Very. Very much so. So you think six? Yeah. Were you thinking more or less? I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking like a six, seven. So I'll just go yeah. seven. And you can go six. Which is a 13, and our total then, it's a great score, 69. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> so, well done. He did, uh, he got two more points than his dad. 
<laughs> well, he was two more points statistic than his yeah, dad. Yeah, he was, he was a, about two more points more sadistic <laughs> yeah. than his dad. That is true. Would have been much more interesting if he would have just taken his dad up on the offer and killed him in the tent. Oh, yeah. It would have been like, oh, easy. Severus would have got like a nine. It. Yeah. Oh, yeah, easily. <laughs> All right, two last things to discuss. No, definitely not. <laughs> definitely let not. Let it play. Let it play. <laughs> oh, sorry. The great. Okay, now you can say it. You gotta, you gotta bring this into the atmosphere. Here. <laughs> no, definitely not. Yeah, it no, does he does not. He is not the great. He he wanted to be Alexander the Great, but he is not. Not even close. Not even close. Very interesting, just like his dad, but interesting for all the wrong reasons. Right. Yeah. <laughs> A little bit of military is like an okay thing and everything else is just like, why, dude? Why? Why? Stop that. Yeah, I don't get the apologists. Um, no. I don't understand it, no, it's, honestly. Oh, he's misunderstood. He's not. He's not. I don't I don't care. He's No, he's just messed up, man. Yeah. He was wrong in the head. He was, yeah. But then, but then, like, seems actually sane. Like, there's no, like, he's not crazy. He's just an angry man who yeah. would lash out. Not crazy like Caligula, who's like, I'm just, I just want to do crazy, horrible things to people. I don't know. It's a fine line. It is. Yes, I get it because he could also do like the admin stuff that he didn't want to do. But man, he had that streak. He sure did. Well, epithets. Yeah. So I've got uh, Caracalla the Killer, the Butcher, <laughs> the Crouch, the Crouch, <laughs> no, the Grimacing, That's too much. the Kinslayer. I don't have much. I couldn't think of anything like super specific. The butcher is a good generic one because he was a just butcher. Want to be like Herrick Hell the Manic? Mm, I don't know about Manic. Just I don't know that it was mania so what much as just what do you anger. Think just going into fits of murdering thousands of people. Yeah, but there weren't fits. Those were calculated. Sure. That, like he planned the massacre at Alexandria. That, okay, that doesn't make it more sane. I think it does, honestly. I don't think it does. Yeah, I think it does. I don't think he was manic. I don't think that's the word. Nothing good. Like the harsh, but yeah, his dad was the, serve- the severe. Yeah, but harsh isn't enough. Yeah, no. <laughs> like, the horrible. Yeah. Oh well. The horrid. That's close. Caracalla, the horrid. That's close. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. we could we could play into it today. Caracalla, the cloaked horror. You know, <laughs> cloaked horror. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Caracalla the cloak. We could Caracalla the cloaked, the cloaked killer. Just really lean into the alliteration. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> the hooded hoodlum. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're getting wacky now. <laughs> the hooded hoodlum. <laughs> no, I'm not for real. Like I like it, but no. it's not real. <laughs> it's like that. No, <laughs> no. Nothing just seems to Nothing, fit it. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, I know. I couldn't think of anything good either. It's he's he's an enigma. The calamitous. <laughs> Caracalla the calamitous. Yeah, I guess calamities only come around so often. The cloaked calamity. Oh my god, <laughs> dude! <laughs> Bring it in. All right, all right. <laughs> the cloaked calamity. <laughs> the cloaked calamity i love it <laughs> i love it dude oh man that alliteration ah oh. oh. and and calamity even has a bunch of a's and l's like his name yeah. <laughs> good, oh, wild good job caracalla oh you know well what do you what do you what do you think's gonna happen next oh so much chaos no air we gotta well Potentially, right? So potential things. The man that was prophesied to be the emperor either does and marries into the family, mm-hmm. or he gets murdered and then someone else in the family takes over. Okay, okay. <laughs> but uh, you know, we'll see. Either way, it's kind of a power vacuum to just see how do we secure the next emperor in the dynasty here. Yes. Yeah, it'll be. It'll it's be very interesting. Very exciting. Well. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed. This was a fun one. We're it's nine thirty at night because we we have Thanksgiving coming up and just wanted to get this recorded. That's right. We're gonna do it yesterday, but we were tired. Impromptu <laughs> plans that were super fun wore us out. So anyway, thank you guys. Um, oh, we do have the videos on YouTube, and I might start adding in some uh, like when I need to show things, I can put them up Those there. Some visuals out there. Potentially, yeah. I am lazy though, so oh, I feel that might not do that, but. Uh, be sure to leave comments if you enjoy. Um, give it a thumbs up. Listen on the Podbean, Spotify, all that good stuff. 
Anyway, thanks. Okay, bye.